Hello, everyone. Welcome to Calvary. Glad to see you all here, and it seems like you fared well after that silly dust storm that we had yesterday. Um, I'm going to read you something here quick. Um, Dear friends, my sister Anne Graham Lotz is calling for women all across America to come together this Sunday for an important hour of prayer for our nation. I hope you will encourage the women in your life to be a part. Anne will use Second Chronicles 7, 13 through 14 as a model for prayer as she calls women to look to God's promise for our nation. In his word, he says, When I shut up heaven and there is no rain, or command the locusts to devour the land, or send pestilence among my people, if my people who are called by my name will humble themselves and pray, and seek my face and turn from their wicked ways, then I will hear from heaven, and I will forgive their sin and heal their land. Um, And uh, so it goes on to say... uh, to forward this email to all the women you know and encourage them to be involved. So definitely let your uh, fellow friends uh, know to pray today. America is in trouble, and we need a a movement of repentance and prayer led by God's people. He is faithful and good, and he will answer us when we pray. Thank you, and may God richly bless you. Um, This was from Franklin Graham. So the hour that they have for our time zone is from 6 to 7 p.m. tonight. And then some announcements that we have. Um, On Wednesdays, we do have the women's Bible study at 9.30. um, And the supper is at 5 o'clock. We would super appreciate it if you guys would sign up if you are planning on attending that supper. So we kind of get a vague head, head count for how much food to have. The sign-up sheet is over on the ushers table over there. Um, And then, of course, the Bible study is at 6. And then, would you all stand and wave a hello to each other? And so we begin our worship in the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. Let's pray. O Lord, our Maker, Redeemer, and Comforter, we are assembled in your presence to hear your holy word. We pray that you would open our hearts by your Holy Spirit, so that at the preaching of your word we may be taught to repent of our sins, to believe on Jesus in life and in death, and to grow day by day in grace and holiness. Hear us for Jesus Christ's sake. Amen. Joel 2, 28 through 32 says, And it shall come to pass afterward that I will pour out my spirit on all flesh. Your sons and your daughters shall prophesy. Your old men shall dream dreams and your young men shall see visions. Even on the male and female servants in those days, I will pour out my spirit. And I will show wonders in the heavens and on the earth, blood and fire and columns of smoke. The sun shall be turned to darkness and the moon to blood before the great and awesome day of the Lord comes. And it shall come to pass that everyone who calls on the name of the Lord shall be saved. For in Mount Zion and in Jerusalem, there shall be those who escape, as the Lord has said, and among the survivors shall be those whom the Lord calls. There shall be showers of blessing, this is the promise of love. There shall be seasons refreshing, sent from the Savior above. Showers of blessing, showers of blessing we need. Mercy drops round us are falling. But for the showers we plead There shall be showers of blessing 
precious reviving again. Oh, the hills and the valleys, sound of abundance on rain. Showers of blessing, showers of blessing they bring. Mercy drops round the earth falling, but for the showers we shall be showers of blessing, send them upon us, O Lord. Grant us to now a refreshing, come and no order thy word. Showers of blessing, showers of blessing we need. Mercy drops round us are falling. shall be showers of blessing, oh, that today they might fall. Now as to God we're confessing, now as on Jesus we call. Showers of blessing, showers of blessing we need. Mercy drops round us are falling. bow before the Lord and confess our sins as we continue to worship. Heavenly Father, we come before you this morning to ask for your forgiveness. We have sinned against you and against ourselves and need your cleansing. We have tried to do what is right, but have not been able to keep our way pure. We know that we are to put to death the deeds of the flesh, yet the old nature dies hard. We need your tender touch and your cleansing grace. Thank you for your forgiveness and mercy. In the name of Jesus Christ, our Lord. Amen. Almighty God, our Heavenly Father, has had mercy on us and has given his only Son to die for us and for his sake forgives us all our sins. To all that believe on his name, he gives power to become children of God and bestows on them his Holy Spirit. The Bible says, whoever believes and is baptized will be saved. Grant us this, O Lord, unto us all. Amen. Shall we read the verse in John 3.16? For God so loved the world that he gave his only Son, that whoever believes in him should not perish but have eternal life. For God did not send his Son into the world to condemn the world, but in order that the world might be saved through him. Amen. Let's pray. Father in heaven, we thank you that you have promised your presence to all of those who come in repentance and faith to you. We thank you, Lord Jesus, for your mercy showered on us. We thank you for pouring out your Holy Spirit on all those who come to you. We thank you, Lord, for giving us the strength we need day by day to face temptation. We thank you, Lord, for your work in our hearts day by day, drawing us closer to yourself, giving us comfort when we hurt, assuring us of your presence and your power in our lives, assuring us constantly of your forgiveness. Lord, we pray that you would be with us this morning, that you would lead us as we worship you so that we pray led by your Holy Spirit. We pray, Lord, for those among us who are hurting, those who are sick, some are facing cancer. We pray especially for Yvonne Olson. We pray that you'd be with her, Lord, and give her your healing. We pray that you'd be with Bruce, and give him your comfort as well. We pray, Lord, for those who are hurting in other ways. We pray particularly for Mark and Barb, Lord. It's hard to be laid off from a job that you love so much, especially one that you pour your heart into. And so we pray that you'd be with them. 
Thank you, Lord, for watching over your church, for leading us forward as we come to you. Lead us carefully, Lord Jesus, like the tender shepherd that you are. Be with us, Lord. In Jesus' name, amen. John chapter 15, the first 11 verses, we read this. I am the true vine, and my father is the vine dresser. Every branch in me that does not bear fruit, he takes away. And every branch that does bear fruit, he prunes that it may bear more fruit. <clears throat> Already you are clean because of the word that I have spoken to you. Abide in me, and I in you. As the branch cannot bear fruit by itself unless it abides in the vine, neither can you unless you abide in me. I am the vine, you are the branches. Whoever abides in me and I in him, he it is that bears much fruit. For apart from me, you can do nothing. If anyone does not abide in me, he is thrown away like a branch and withers, and the branches are gathered, thrown into the fire, and burned. If you abide in me, and my words abide in you, ask whatever you wish, and it will be done for you. By this my Father is glorified, that you bear much fruit, and so prove to be my disciples. As the Father has loved me, so have I loved you. Abide in my love. If you keep my commandments, you will abide in my love, just as I have kept my Father's commandments and abide in his love. These things I have spoken to you, that my joy may be in you and that your joy may be full. Here ends our scripture reading from the gospel according to John. We'll talk more about that later. We respond to the word of God by confessing our faith using the words of the Apostles' Creed. Would you like to stand and confess our faith together? I believe in God, the Father Almighty, maker of heaven and earth, and in Jesus Christ, his only Son, our Lord, who was conceived by the Holy Spirit, born of the Virgin Mary, suffered under Pontius Pilate, was crucified, dead, and buried. He descended into hell. The third day he rose again from the dead. He ascended into heaven and is seated on the right hand of God the Father Almighty, from where he shall come to judge the living and the dead. I believe in the Holy Spirit, the Holy Christian Church, the communion of saints, the forgiveness of sins, the resurrection of the body, and the life everlasting. Amen. Please take your seats, and the ushers will bring our offering forward uh, because of the risk of contamination of the virus we're, we've taken to uh, leaving the offering plates on the ushers' table in the back, and we'll just bring them forward. Um, if you missed it, there's still a plate in the back there that you can use. <laughs> uh, and if you're at home, you can go online to the calvaryfreelutheran.org and click where it says online donation, and you can give your offering that way. Let's pray. Father in heaven, we thank you for the way that you have been so faithful to us and the way that you've kept your promise to provide our needs Lord, we know that you are faithful and will continue to take care of your children. And so we bring this offering in, as an expression of gratitude and faith to you. We pray that you'd receive it and bless it and use it for the extension of your kingdom. In Jesus' name, amen. is a 
of truth thou sendest clear. And while the wave notes fall on my ear, everything else will disappear. Silently now I wait for thee, ready, my God, thy will to see. This is kind of different. We're used to having a couple of pastors and it doesn't happen this way very often where I'm up and down. But uh, Luther and Elroy are both out of town this week. There's Pastor Lee right here. We should have grabbed him. (laughs) John chapter 15, the verses we just read. I am the true vine, my father is the vine dresser. Every branch in me that does not bear fruit he takes away, and every branch that does bear fruit he prunes that it may bear more fruit. Already you're clean because of the word that I have spoken to you. Abide in me and I in you. As the branch cannot bear fruit by itself unless it abides in the vine, neither can you unless you abide in me. I am the vine, you are the branches. Whoever abides in me and I in him, he it is that bears much fruit, for apart from me you can do nothing. If anyone does not abide in me, he's thrown away like a branch and withers, and the branches are gathered, thrown into the fire, and burned. If you abide in me and my words abide in you, ask whatever you wish, and it will be done for you. By this is my Father glorified, that you bear much fruit and so prove to be my disciples. As the Father has loved me, so have I loved you. Abide in my love. If you keep my commandments, you will abide in my love, just as I have kept my Father's commandments and abide in his love. These things I have spoken to you, that my joy may be in you, that your joy may be full. Everything that the Lord said in the upper room on the night of his betrayal is of vast importance. He was aware that he had only a few hours left to instruct his disciples. And so he said only the most important and essential things that they needed to hear before he was taken away from them. The time after the resurrection and before the ascension, as we have talked about in the last few weeks, uh, was set aside for instruction about the kingdom and what shape it would take going forward. But this time on Thursday night was spent doing and saying some of the most important lessons that he wanted to communicate to his disciples. Today we just read some of the things that the Lord Jesus said that night that no human teacher, no merely human teacher would ever have a right to say. If Jesus were just a man and said the things that we just read, we would have to conclude that he was a raving lunatic with delusions of divinity, that he actually thought he was God. But you'll notice that none of the disciples got up and said, Jesus, you're crazy. What do you mean by abide in me and I in you and as the branch cannot bear fruit by itself unless it abides in the vine neither can you unless you abide in me just who do you think you are nobody said that they knew very well who he was by this time 
they were so thoroughly convinced of it that they would all eventually willingly go to a martyr's death. Most of them would be imprisoned. Many of them would be tortured beyond human endurance in the process, never even considering taking back the teaching of the gospel that Jesus Christ is God the Son and our loving and merciful eternal Savior. So let's see just what it was that the Lord was saying to them that night in these words. I am the true vine. My father is the vine dresser. He was saying, and makes it even more clear a couple of verses later, that we get our life from him, that he's the source of life and strength and growth for us. He was saying that we are connected to him organically in the spiritual sense and that we are a part of him just as branches are a part of the vine. Every branch in me that does not bear fruit, he takes away. And every branch that does bear fruit, he prunes that it may bear more fruit. That first pr phrase, he, every branch in me that does not bear fruit, he takes away, it might be taken a couple of different ways. The phrase, he takes away, is a Greek word, uh, fero, that it means to pick up, to carry, or to take away. So the most obvious understanding, and the one that many assume, is that um, the father will snip off and take away an unproductive branch and throw it away. Uh, but that sounds more like pruning, which is done when a branch becomes unproductive because it's not getting sap from the vine and has to be snipped off. That idea is covered a couple more verses ahead, but here he's talking about a branch that is still in him. He says, every branch in me that is not producing fruit, not a dry branch that isn't still abiding in him, it's just not producing anything. And I suspect it might be better translated, every branch in me that does not bear fruit, he lifts up. So just as a vine dresser would tenderly pick up a branch that has become weak and fallen down into the dirt and is unproductive because it's deprived of sunlight and nutrition, dust it off, clean it with tender care, and prop it up until it becomes stronger. So the Father does with us. The next part of that verse, verse 2, says, Every branch that does bear fruit, he prunes so that it might bear more fruit. Pruning is a painful process if you're a tree or if you're a vine. Have you ever noticed that? When a tree or even more a grapevine is pruned, the vine dresser whacks off absolutely anything that would take away from the fruit-bearing purpose of the vine. The grapevines are possibly more severely pruned than any other agricultural plant. Grapevines have been cultivated for thousands of years, maybe longer than almost any other kind of plant that farmers grow. And as a result, there's this long and deep traditional body of knowledge surrounding the art of viticulture, the art of growing grapes. Any farmer can tell you that the whole purpose of growing a crop is to produce the fruit of that crop. And uh, any vine dresser will tell you that the whole purpose of a grapevine is to produce grapes. And anything that's on the grapevine that isn't producing grapes has to go, has to be trimmed away. And so the, the goal of the vine dresser is in, in in countries where viticulture is a really important thing, um, you start learning the art of being a vine dresser as a child, and you grow up with it. And by the time you're an old guy, you really know a lot about grapes. You know everything there is to know about getting those grapevines to produce the maximum fruit. That's your whole purpose in life. And so the vine dresser spends a lifetime 
becoming an expert in getting the vine to do just that, to produce grapes. And so the Heavenly Father takes a personal interest in each branch of the vine of the body of Christ, each one of us. He tenderly addresses every aspect of our lives with the sole purpose of bringing us to the point of maximum productivity in bearing the fruit of the Spirit. His goal is that we reflect His glory in our lives by bearing the fruit of love, joy, peace, patience, kindness, goodness, faithfulness, gentleness, and self-control. These are the fruit of the Spirit that's described for us in Galatians chapter 5. They are the personality traits of God himself. And where these are visible in our lives, the character of God is seen in us and God is glorified. That's what it means to produce fruit as a vine, as a branch of the vine of Jesus. And so when we are failing to produce this kind of fruit, God goes to work on us. When we are unfruitful, but still attached to the vine, weak, still smothered in the dirt of this life, he tenderly lifts us up out of the dirt, cleans us off, and supports us so that we can be strengthened. I learned years ago, if you really need a prayer answered, find a new Christian and get them to pray with you. Because God is being really meticulous about answering their prayers. They need encouragement. And so God tenderly hears them. Get children to pray with you. God loves to hear children's prayers. And those aspects of our lives that are actually harmful and get in the way of our relationship with Jesus will have to be removed. Old habits have to be abandoned and a whole new set of friends will replace the old ones as Jesus, as the Father lifts us up and supports us and dusts us off. God is lifting us up, taking, taking us away, not away from Jesus, but away from all of that. When we're strengthened and begin to finally produce the fruit of the Spirit, then he goes to work on us again with all the same tenderness, but now the pruning process begins. This pruning process can be painful. Now we find that there are areas of our lives that are unproductive. They may not even be overtly bad or sinful, but and, and while they may not keep us away from Jesus, they're keeping us from producing that fruit of the Spirit, that love and joy and peace and patience and kindness that God wants to see. Little pet sins and selfish attitudes that in another person might not be a problem, but that keep us from really showing forth God's character traits in our lives come under the magnifying glass and God begins to strip them away. God doesn't override our personality in the process. He doesn't just magically change a self-centered, prideful, arrogant, bitter Christian into a selfless, humble, meek, and sweet-tempered one. He gently points out what needs to be trimmed away and asks our permission to go to work on it. The pruning process often involves putting us into situations where we have to choose to either react in God's way or continue to react in the old way of our sinful nature. If we fail to respond to the situation in the way that shows the fruit of the Spirit, we suffer the natural consequences of our choice. And then he has to get out a little bigger clipper. 
Very soon we find ourselves in another situation, usually one with more severe consequences resulting if we fail to respond to it in God's way. God's at work in our lives, pruning away those things that keep us from showing forth the character of God, the fruit of the Spirit. It's a painful process. And we all go through it time after time in each new area of our lives. God is snipping away with his pruning snippers at our old habits, at our old nature, so that the fruit of the Spirit can be produced in us. As the Holy Spirit flowing like the sap of the vine from Jesus into you and me is able to flow unrestricted and produce that fruit. When one pruning job is done for the moment, he moves on to a new area and continues his work. I see a lot of heads nodding. You've been going through this for a while. You know what I'm talking about. It's not so much that we're getting better. It's just that more of our old nature is being pruned away. And Jesus is being seen more clearly in our lives. This all depends not on our effort to improve so much as on our relationship with Jesus. God points out what needs to be cut away by putting us into these situations that will highlight our sinful nature by our response. And we choose to respond in God's way instead, drawing the strength to do that from him. That's why he says, abide in me and I in you. As the branch cannot bear fruit by itself unless it abides in the vine, neither can you unless you abide in me. I am the vine, you are the branches. That pruning will take place if I'm a part of the vine. The question is, will I respond to the tender, loving touch of the vine dresser, or does he have to get out the hedge clippers? <laughs> the uh, closer we stay to Jesus, the more successful that pruning process will be as his life flows through us. Whoever abides in me and I in him, he it is that bears much fruit, for apart from me you can do nothing, he said. Now what happens if we resist the loving hand of God working away at our hearts in such a tender way? Sometimes on a plant, a branch becomes so woody, so tough, that the flow of the sap is cut off. The branch seems to think it can do very well on its own and doesn't need the sap of the vine anymore. I have an orange tree in my front yard that a few of you got to know a few weeks ago. We were going to have an open house at our, at our house for the church and a group of men and women came over to help me get the yard ready so that we could have an open house without embarrassing the whole church. There were branches on that orange tree that had just plain died and weren't drinking the sap of the tree any longer. We used to call it squaw wood in the Boy Scouts. It's branches that are dead but still attached to the tree. And you're camping in the woods and it's raining hard and you need to make a fire. That's what you look for. Because those branches are suspended up in the air and they will stay dry. And you can snap them off and make a fire out of them when all the wood laying around on the ground is soaking wet. Wonderful stuff. Saved my life a few times out in the, in the boondocks. All those dead branches had to come off of that orange tree. And the funny thing is now that tree is healthier than it had been in several years as a result. If anyone does not abide in me, he's thrown away like a branch and withers. 
and the branches are gathered, thrown into the fire and burned. That sounds pretty drastic, doesn't it? But it's a normal procedure for a vine dresser or an orchard keeper. Dead branches still apparently attached to the vine, but not abiding in it, not living on the sweet, nourishing sap of the vine or the tree are nothing but firewood. Stay close to Jesus. Draw your life from him. If you abide in me and my words abide in you, ask whatever you wish and it will be done for you. Now, if we abide in him, if we continue to draw our life from him, then we are in this loving relationship with him and have access to the throne of God and our prayer life will show it. When we pray, we will be asking for his will to be done in our lives because the Holy Spirit is flowing through us and teaching us how to pray. And we have his promise in 1 John chapter 5. This is the confidence that we have toward him that if we ask anything according to his will, he hears us. And we know, if we know that he hears us in whatever we ask, we know that we have the requests that we have asked of him. Now, I've seen Christians whose life does not indicate that they are abiding in Christ in any meaningful way, and yet their prayers are often answered. In fact, I have seen some who are actually living in shameful secret sins, which eventually come to light. And meanwhile, they have a ministry of praying for the sick and seeing them healed and many other things. You wonder about that. Answered prayer is not an indication of a clear spiritual walk, but a clear relationship with Jesus brings us into a healthy prayer life. God is gracious and merciful, and he answers the prayers of his children even when we are disobedient because he's a loving father. You don't quit feeding your your kids or providing for their needs when they're disobedient. You still love them. Answered prayer is a gift of grace, not something we earn. Spiritual gifts, including speaking in tongues, the working of miracles, even prophecy, are just that, gifts of grace. They don't necessarily indicate spiritual maturity. They aren't fruit. They're gifts. There's a difference. The fruit of the Spirit, however, is a direct result, the fruit of spiritual growth, and is a real indicator of our relationship with Jesus. As surely as a side, and purely as a side benefit, That ongoing relationship also puts us into this place of special communion with the Father where our prayers grow out of that relationship and are guided by the Holy Spirit so that we know he's hearing us as we pray and we know that they will be answered. Then the Lord goes on back in John chapter 15. Verse 8, he says, By this the Father is glorified, that you bear much fruit, and so prove to be my disciples. God is not glorified so much by the manifestation of spiritual gifts in us, or great miraculous answers to our prayers, as he is by the production of spiritual fruit in our lives. As the traits of his character are seen in us, He is made known to those around us. Please understand, I'm not saying that we despise spiritual gifts. The Bible says that we should not despise them, that we should earnestly seek the higher gifts, especially that we might prophesy. But if we want to see the fruit of the Spirit in our lives, we need most of all to stay close to Jesus 
and submit to the Father's loving pruning process in our lives. Next, the Lord explains what he means when he says, Abide in me and I in you. He says, As the Father has loved me, so have I loved you. Abide in my love. If you keep my commandments, you will abide in my love, just as I have kept my Father's commandments and abide in his love. The Lord tells us that if we keep, the Greek word is tereo, it actually means to hold fast, to keep our eye on his commandments, we are abiding in his love. Now notice, he isn't talking about getting the forgiveness of our sins or finding our way into his love. He told us at the beginning, already you are clean because of the word that I have spoken to you. Now he tells us, as the Father has loved me, so have I loved you. Past tense, I have loved you. His love and his forgiveness, being cleansed from the guilt of our sins, these things are already ours by grace alone. But abiding in his love, living in it, dwelling in his love that is already ours, staying close to him, keeping the relationship flowing will not be possible if we pay no attention to his commandments, if we don't keep our eye on them. As his, life, as his life flows through us, his spirit is constantly working repentance in us. And so we are kept close to him. We want to keep his commandments. We treasure them in our hearts. And so we keep our eye on them so that they will guide our lives, or rather so that the Holy Spirit guides our lives through them. Remember, you can never separate between the Holy Spirit and the Word of God. They will never contradict. The one will never contradict the other. The Word and the Spirit always work together in our lives. It isn't so much that keeping his commandments keeps us close to him as that staying close to Jesus means that we will keep his commandments. The Lord points out that he kept his father's commandments and was abiding in his love. He didn't earn the love of his father by his obedience. He obeyed because of the loving relationship that flows between God the Father and the Son. The son's obedience to the will of the father flowed out of that relationship of love and was evidence of it. You and I were created to be in fellowship with God. We were created for his glory to show forth the character of God in our lives. That's our purpose in existing, our reason for being. We weren't created for self-fulfillment. The whole idea of self-realization is a satanic lie. We were created for a much higher purpose and calling. But we as an entire human race were hoodwinked into the lie of self-realization and self-fulfillment. And so we lost the precious joy of fulfilling our purpose by reflecting the glory of God. When we come to Jesus in repentance and faith, we return to that purpose for which we were created. The joy of fulfilling the purpose for which we were created is found in this relationship with God, where his life, his Holy Spirit flows through us as we abide in Jesus and draw our life from him. And so the Lord ends up what he's saying with these words, these things I have spoken to you that my joy may be in you and that your joy may be full. Finding the forgiveness of your sins is the very first step in God's plan for your life. That's where it all begins. And that, at that moment, God begins a new creation. That moment when you receive the Lord Jesus Christ into your heart, you are grafted into the vine of Christ and you become a part of his body and his life begins to flow through you. As you abide in him, 
as you live in that new relationship with Jesus, the life of his Holy Spirit will flow through you. And you will see how the fruit of his life in you begins to appear. You'll go through periods of pruning, sometimes severe and painful ones. But the end result is the joy of living the life for which God created you. Let him do it in your life. You will find more satisfaction, more peace, more joy in living life as God intends it than in anything that you could ever make happen by your own efforts, your own maneuverings, by getting things to happen the way you want them. Lord Jesus, you are the vine. I am a branch. I confess that I struggle with the concept. Sometimes I think I have a better idea. Sometimes I think that if I could only make life go the way I want it, I would be happy and satisfied and feel the joy of self-fulfillment. But you are the source of life. You made me for a higher purpose than that. And so I say, Lord, not what I want, not my will, but yours be done. When pruning is needed, Lord, prune me. Where I need you to lift me up and carry me and support me, Lord, lift me up. Never let anything in my life keep the flow of your Holy Spirit, your life from feeding me and nourishing my spirit and producing the fruit of your very character in my life. You are the Lord of my life. Amen. to stand and pray with me in the words that Jesus taught that last hymn was written about 600 AD can you tell 
<laughs> Beautiful. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come. Thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. Lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, and the power, and the glory, forever and ever. Amen. Now receive this blessing from the Lord. The Lord bless you and keep you. The Lord make his face shine upon you and be gracious unto you. The Lord lift up his countenance upon you and give you peace. In the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. Our worship service is ended. Go in peace. Serve the Lord. <laughs>